On behalf of the AO Spine Knowledge Forum, I want to welcome you to the new Upper Cervical Spine Classification System. My name is Alex Vaccaro. I'm a professor of spine surgery at Thomas Jefferson University, and I have the honor to show you a new system that takes us out of the confusion of looking at the upper cervical spine in different series of classification systems. And we've sort of distilled the entire classification systems into the A, B, and C of the AO system so it's easy to understand, easier to digest, easier to put in practice, easier to keep a registry so we understand what we're speaking about using a similar language to tell us if we have a stable injury, unstable injury, and modes of treatment. So I want to welcome you. So the goal is basically to keep it simple, keep it reproducible. It's based on injury morphology and it's a hierarchical. It goes from something that's simple and stable to something more complex. And again, just like the thracal lumbar and subaxial cervical system, we have a neurologic profile to review with you that we use. And all the neurologic systems are the same now. We use the same thing in all the different systems. Now in the upper cervical spine, instead of having a different classification for condyle, occipital cervical, C1 ring, we only have three categories. Each one talks about the bone and the joint below. So category one, occipital condyle injury and occipital cervical injuries. That's at the junction of the occiput and C1. Two, C1 ring and C1-2 joint injuries. And three, C2 vertebral body and C2-3 joint complex injuries. So only three categories, one, two, and three. So it should be much, much easier to understand. And again, we use the A, B, and C subcategorizations. A, any type of bony injuries without any significant ligamentous tension band injury. Keep it simple. Bone only, no significant ligamentous disruption, no significant tension band. B is a tension band injury. It may or may not have a bony injury. It can be stable or unstable. It can need surgery or it may not need surgery. But you know you have a tension band injury, so you have to be very careful in the management of that type of injury. And the last is any time you see translation. And the key thing when we talk about translation, we're not talking about an odontoid fracture where the peg moves. We're talking about vertebral translation or any type of separation. You could have an odontoid fracture, but the C1, C2 complex distracts. That's a C injury. But if the peg moves, but the vertebral bodies are intact, it's not a C injury. If you have a hangman, atypical, we have significant flexion, well, that's a tension band injury, but not a C injury because the vertebral body is not translating. But if you have a hangman's fracture where it's translating and angulating, that's a C type injury. So that's the way I want you to think about it. So let's stop, start from the top. Category one, occipital condyle fracture slash occipital cervical junction. Type injury, any type of stable injury. That can be a condyle fracture or a comminuted com, uh, condyle fracture. It doesn't have to be unstable. Type B means you have a ligamentous injury. It's not, it may or may not be unstable. If you do a stress test, you may see separation. In that situation, that can change from a B to a C. But if you identify a ligamentous injury, but everything is non-displaced, that's a type B injury because you have a ligamentous injury, keep close eye on that injury, that could be a problem. Now, if you see separation between the occipital cervical junction, that's a type C, those are extremely unstable. So that's the occipital occipital cervical junction. Now, category number two, C1 ring, C1-2 joint. Remember in the past, the Atlas, different classifications had four types, others had seven. I've seen some with 11 type. This is totally simple. You have type A, which is just a bony injury. It could be the anterior arch, it could be the posterior arch, it could be a lateral mass. You don't have any significant ligamentous disruption. Type B, transverse ligamentous injury doesn't mean it's unstable. If you have a mid-substance tear, that is potentially unstable, and we have modifiers for that in the future. But this is when you have a transverse ligamentous injury. It can evulse bone, it may not evulse bone. So you call it a type B injury, and then you could subclassify. So keep that in mind. And type, type C is when you have rotation or displacement. Then you know you have a problem. Now keep in mind, some of these injuries will be type B, transverse ligamentous disruption, you may put it in a collar, you may put it in a halo, and then at the end of treatment, non-operatively, you may do flexion extension and see significant instability, and then that's unstable. But in the meantime, 
It may not manifest as a type C injury, so you still call it a type B injury. Now the last category is C2 body, C2-3 joint. Now there's a lot of things in this category. You could have a dontoid injury, you could have a hangman injury, you could have a C2 body injury. So type A, stable, bony injury, no ligamentous or tension band injury, no translation. That's type A. Here's an example of an odontoid fracture, type A. So all the odontoid fractures are type A. We'll have modifiers to tell which ones may or not, may not be appropriate with non-operative treatment. One may have a higher risk of non-healing. That's a modifier, but right now, odontoid fractures, those are uh, type A injuries. Type B is a tension band injury. This is a typical hangman's fracture that we call unstable because it's a flexion distraction injury. The posterior tension band is disrupted as well as a disc. This is what we consider very unstable. If you put this patient in traction, you can pit the spinal cord. So that is clearly a type B injury, but there's no translation. Type C, there's definite translation. Now, some may argue that this type of injury is stable. You can extend the neck, put it in a collar or a halo, but you have translation of the C2 body on C3. So that's a type C injury. We have to keep that in mind. Now the crux to the upper cervical system are the modifiers. M1, M2, M3, and M4. M1 means this injury has a potential to go on to non-healing. Typical example is a C2 odontoid fracture at the waist. If it's displaced, if it's more than five millimeters translated, if you treat it and it's stable but then it displaces, if it's someone over the age of 50, you put an M1 modifier. M2, there's a potential for instability. People say, well, what's that? Well, if you have a mid-substance transverse ligamentous injury without a bony involution, that's probably an unstable injury. But all the anatomic relationships may be normal. C1 and C2 may not have an increased ADI. You may not have a decreased PADI. So you have to look at that carefully. I would use M2 for that. M3, you have certain morbidities that make the patient a difficult candidate for either non-operative treatment or surgical treatment. The patient may be old. The patient may have comorbidities. The patient may have a neurologic deficit. If I have an atypical hangman's fracture, remember, that's a type um, A injury. That's through bone only. But if the patient has a neurologic deficit, what can happen? I'm going to apply M3 because I may want to get more aggressive surgically to reduce that or to de decompress, decompress the neural elements. And then the last one is M4. You have a vascular injury. Anytime you're looking at the occipital cervical junction, you have to look at the vertebral arteries to know exactly what the status is. Now, the same neurology classification applies to the thracolumbar, subaxial. It'll apply for the um, upper cervical spine. And then we have one for the sacrum that's somewhat similar. So N0, neurologically intact. N1, you had a transient neurologic complaints. The patient didn't feel their arms or legs or had paresthesias, but then it resolved. N2, radiculopathy, M3, incomplete spinal cord injury, N4, complete spinal cord injury. NX, the patient's unconscious. You have no idea what the neurologic status is. And then if you put a plus, and you can only use plus if the patient has a neurologic deficit, that means there's continued spinal cord compression. And it tells me we may have to do something surgically because the patient has a neurologic deficit plus continued neurologic uh, compromise. Now, to illustrate how simple this system is, I have five cases, and I want to take you through these cases slowly. Case one is an elderly woman who fell down, hit her head. She has neck pain, no neurologic complaints. And if you look closely at these CT images, especially the transaxial views, you can see that there's an atlas fracture. The anterior arch is fractured and the posterior arch is fractured. But on the side view, there's no instability between the C1, C2 articulation or between the the anterior surface of the C1 ring and the odontoid. So that would be a type A injury. And you don't have to put, it would be N0 for neurologically intact. I want you to focus though, it's a type A injury, it's neurologically intact. Here's a perfect example of an elderly person who falls down and has an odontoid fracture. Now I know this patient has a very low chance of healing. I know the vertebral bodies are not translated, so it's not a C. I know that the transverse ligament is not disrupted, so it's not a B. It's an A injury, but I know with non-operative treatment, it's probably not going to heal. So it's a type A injury, and M1 says to me, this will likely go on to non-healing. May not, but likely, and that's so important. When someone sees M1, we think about being a little bit more aggressive from a surgical 
perspective. Case three, this is a perfect example of an atypical Hangman's fracture. 45-year-old gentleman, look at that piece of bone at the body. It's sort of avulsed off with the posterior elements. If the anterior body moves anteriorly, the ring stays posteriorly, and you can pit the spinal cord, and the patient can have a brown succord neurologic deficit. So it makes me a little worried. It's an A injury because it's bone only, but there's no neurologic deficit, so it's an N0. It usually will go on to heal, so I'm calling it a type A because there's no ligamentous disruption, there's no tension band disruption, there's no translation because it's an atypical hangman's fracture. If you look closely at this patient, it's a female, and you can see the separation between the C1 ring and the odontoid peg. Automatically, I see instability. So we have disruption at the C1, C2 articulation, so it's a type C injury, and the patient can't be examined, so it's an NX. So that's how you do it. You see the instability, you see the translation between C1, C2, patient can't be examined. So someone would describe that as a C1, C2 type C, C injury with an NX neurologic profile. And the last is a dislocation at C2, 3. So if you look closely, you see the translation at C2, 3. You can see that with a really bad hangman's fracture, or you can see that with a dislocation at C2, 3. Look closely at the sagittal profile, how unstable that is, and look at the transaxials. You'll see two almost superimposed vertebral bodies. So it's a C2, 3, C, and N1 just tells you that the patient had a neurologic problem that has resolved by the time that I got to the operating room. So that's how simple this system is. This system no longer says we have the Anderson, Delonzo, we have the, the Montesano classification. We get, a, we get away from all the different names. We talk A, B, and C. We talk about three different areas. It's always the bone above and the joint below. Occipital condyle, occipital cervical junction. C1 ring, C1, C2 junction. C2 vertebral body, C2, 3 joint complex. That's all we want to know. And you can use your descriptor. If you have a type A, it's okay to say the word odontoid because it sort of allows people to speak the same language. But if I say type A for odontoid with an M1, I know I'm dealing with an odontoid fracture, probably what we used to call a type 2 that has a good chance to not heal. So I really want you to study this. I think this is the simplest of all the classification systems, and we sort of open your mind to a new way of understanding these injuries. Thank you on behalf of the AO Spine Knowledge Forum.